Let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter 15. Uh, between now and Easter, we are considering some of the teaching and some of the uh, things that happened in the life of Jesus as he is headed towards the cross. Jesus was very intentional about going to the cross. He, he knew that he came to seek and to save those who were lost and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so his intentionality in going to the cross, was, he was very deliberate about that. But we see as he is heading towards Jerusalem, and last week we picked it up as he is turning towards Jerusalem and going in the direction of that final confrontation, and he's going in the direction of, of, uh, of the Last Supper, of the betrayal of Jesus, of prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's walking into the direction of being accused by the Jewish leaders and, and later put on trial by Pontius Pilate, or a Roman governor. He's, he's going in the direction of the scourging. He knows it's coming. He's walking towards the cross. He knows uh, he'll be crucified. He'll know, he knows his life will be given. He knows after three days he will be raised from the dead and that he would have paid uh, for the sins of the world for all who would receive that blessing. And so we, we see him marching towards the cross, but as he does so, he's, he's got people and the kingdom of God on his mind. He's trying to correct the wrong thinking that exists among the Jewish leadership and, and among some of the, po the populace. And he's explaining the heart of God. And, and this is a beautiful parable here today that we study, uh, known as the, the, the story or the parable of the prodigal son, but we're gonna see that it's much more than that. And so follow along with me if you would. We're gonna start at verse one, read verses one to three, and then skip down to verse 11, kind of take that whole thing in, and then we'll come back and, and uh, consider bit by bit. Luke chapter 15, verse one. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them. He goes on to tell a couple of parables, and then the third parable we, we see in verse 11. Then he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and, sent, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father... I've sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, and when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this, son of, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to, make, to be merry. Now his older son was in the field and as he came and drew near to the house he heard music and dancing so he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come. And because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. 
Let's pray together. Thank you so much, Lord, that the whole gospel message, the whole story is about redemption. It's about bringing spiritually dead people to yourself and making them alive and then living with them and dwelling in them and walking with them and blessing them and healing them and changing them and using them, Lord. Thank you that you have such grand and great and pure and holy desires for each one of us in this room, Lord. Left to ourselves, Lord, we aim too low. But Lord, if we would look to you, we would see the great things that you want to do in us and through us, Lord, to transform us. So help us to learn today, Lord, from you. Teach us by your spirit, we pray, God. We pray you bless Adam, the youth, all the kids. Thank you for mommies and dads and and grandparents and uncles and aunts that bring their kids to church, Lord. We pray that those kids would have a tremendous experience today and that we would too. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. God loves and receives the repentant sinner is the theme, is the title for this. And the setting we see, and we have to always, when we're considering these things, we always have to realize and understand what the setting is. Look at verses one to three once again. All the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And because they said that, he started telling them parables about the heart of God. The Jewish leadership of the day believed that they were God's chosen people, and in, and in one aspect they were. To, to them was first given the word of God. To them was first revealed the heart of God and the ways of God. But they thought by virtue of simply of their, of their bloodline uh, that God would accept them. And having that self-righteousness and having that wrong sense of entitlement and privilege, they began to look down on anybody, of course, that wasn't Jewish. And even among their own Jewish brethren, they began to look down on many people. And they thought that their call from God was to separate themselves from sinful people. Because sinful people would uh, taint you. Sinful, pe sinful people would uh, bring sin into your life. And separation was the call of the day. And so because they believed that so strongly, guys, they were angry with Jesus. This man receives sinners and eats with them. What a horrible accusation. <laughs> Of course he receives sinners. He came to save sinners. And they did not understand the heart of God regarding people that would come to God and say, I'm sorry. I've sinned against you, Lord. I've sinned against people. I've sinned against my loved ones and neighbors. And, and in so many ways, Lord, forgive me. And God is happy to forgive people and receive them. But in their minds, the exact truth was opposite. I didn't put a quote in here by uh, a man named William Barclay, but he said the Jewish mindset, that they, their mindset was such that they thought that God would rejoice over the obliteration and damnation of the sinner. And so they, 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 they were not interested in seeing any sick, emotionally messed up addicts, criminals, liars, anything. They were not interested in seeing any of these people received by God. They just thought, you know, we're better off without them. And so their accusation against Jesus, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And I think probably a lot of us are glad about that. <laughs> There's one. Anybody else? Okay. We're glad because God has received us. Jesus teaches this, this parable. He speaks about the younger son. There's a man that had two sons, verse 11. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. The younger son here, normally in that day, guys, you know, when, when is an inheritance received from, from an elder uh, relative? It's received when that person dies. Now, from what I understand, it was within the father's power to, to skirt that regular practice if he wanted to. But generally speaking, you don't receive an inheritance until the father or the rich uncle or the grandfather or whomever is dead. And in saying, in saying Father, I want my portion now, in essence, he is saying, Dad, I don't want you. I just want your stuff. And in fact, it really doesn't even matter to me if you were dead. Because when I get my stuff, I'm not going to have another thought of you. 
I just want what's coming to me. And so this is a massive insult against the father. This is a massive insult and a sin against the family. And it's a scandalous thing within the community that the son would come and do such a thing. Verse 12, once again, the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them the livelihood. The younger son was completely self-absorbed, and he just wanted what he wanted. And so because there were two sons, the older son would get two-thirds of the estate. The younger son would get one-third of the estate. In essence, guys, notice this also in verse 12. He divided to them his livelihood. He just split it all up right at that, that, at that point. And in essence, now the sons had all of the material wealth of the estate. The father, of course, I'm sure stayed on as the father and the figurehead or, or something like that. But the older son got his portion as well. And dad has, dad has just been, in some ways, declared dead. Certainly by the younger son. I don't want you. I just want your money. And so that's what he's saying. Verse 13 not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. He wasted no time in seeking his freedom. In his mind, life is going to be much better apart from dad. Now, we who have gone past teenage years, of course, we never thought such things. <laughs> it's very natural for a young person to want independence. Not to the point of saying, Dad, give me what I have coming. I don't ever intend on seeing you again. In fact, I probably won't even be back for your funeral. In fact, I don't care if you're dead. Just give me my stuff. And so he, he in his mind, just lost power. I just lost power for a second. Did you hear that? Hey, what do you know? Some kind of time-space warp thing. I'm trying to think of some clever Star Trek term, but I can't. I didn't have enough coffee this morning. Beam me in, no, it's not a beam me up. Okay, now I got to find out where I was. I have to keep talking like this till I, as I just filling in the time here, I'm actually trying to remember where I was. So that's a little trick, so you guys will know this. He just wanted his stuff. He didn't care about dad, and he and he thinks in his mind life apart from dad is going to be much better. So he doesn't waste any time at all in getting away. Verse 13, once again, not many days after the younger son journeyed. God, he gathered all together. He journeyed to a far country. He doesn't go down the street. He doesn't go across town. He gets out of dad's reach. I don't want to be near dad at all. I don't want to be near that community because if he just rents an apartment down the street, he doesn't have to see dad, but he has to see all dad's friends. And everybody's going to say, how could you do that to your father? How could you treat him that way? How could you humiliate him? How could you shame him that way? How could you put him uh, in such an awkward position that he would have to respond to you that way? And so he just wants to get as far away as he can from dad. That, that word prodigal right there, guys, it means wasteful, extravagant, excessive. It's excessive gratification. It's just self-absorption. It's, it's nothing but self-service. Verse 14. And when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine, and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. He practiced excessive living while he had money, but he, it, it, there's no uh, appearance or there's no clue here that he was working. He was not reinvesting in himself. He was only spending, spending, spending. That's going to come to an end. It always comes to an end. Whenever there's excessive living, Self-gratifying living, when somebody is so self-absorbed that they forget their loved ones, they forget their responsibilities, and they're just going after, there's nothing but gratification. That's the only thing in their mind. And maybe some escape or something like that. Maybe they think they're going to fulfill their dreams by going out and, and, and not being reined in by dad and community and culture and church and tradition and all of these other things. By the way, we just saw a fiddler on the roof recently, so now I understand the tradition thing. So, you know, I want to be free of all of that. And he thinks it's going to be fine. And he's living, he's living off of dad. And he's not investing in his own life at all. And it can only go so far. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to know it. It can only go so far. And so he, he starts coming to an end. Look at verse 14. When he had spent all, it, he ran out. 
And people always run out. If you're not investing, if you're not working, if you're not taking care, if you're not being responsible, you're going to run out. But it's very interesting, and some of the commentators suggested that Jesus was implying that the famine was orchestrated by God in the story because the famine doesn't come until he's out of money. So it's not, you know, if he runs out of money, that's hard enough. But it seems as though in the parable, God says he's running out of money. I'm going to give him a double whammy and let him really feel what it's like now. Because if he runs out of money, but there's not a famine, at least some people maybe have some food to spare. But it's really bad now because he ran out of money and people don't, don't have food to spare. So now he's really, really feeling the pressure of his sinful decision. He's really feeling the pressure and the consequences of deciding that life away from dad is better. I mean, you know, in the story, you guys know who dad is, right? God. Jesus is speaking about God the Father. And a lot of people do that today. Life away from, from, from God, life away from God telling me what to do, life away from the church, breathing down my throat, life away from my spouse, life away from my friends, life away from this. I just need to be my own person. I'm going to go do this thing. I'm going to throw off all restraints, and I think it's going to be better. And sure, there's some gratification for a while, or else we'd turn, turn around right away. But the gratification comes to an end because the flesh is never satisfied. It's never fully gratified. It just wants more and more and more, and you run out of money and all these other things. And so the, he's, he runs out of money. There's a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Okay, now this is, this is where it gets good. Not according to him, but this is where it starts, this is where it starts to change. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's a really good idea to not rescue people. Right? I say right. Okay, because I'm, I'm right, because I have the microphone. <laughs> Sometimes it's really good. I'm not saying about being brutal to people or not helping people that are genuinely in need, but if somebody gets a full head of steam and they want to go do their thing and they're just throwing off all restraint and all that, when they start to feel the consequences of sin, sometimes mom and dad or grandparents or a friend or somebody will come along and rescue them and never let them feel the consequences of their sin. Now, I don't know if dad could have got to this guy, but Jesus doesn't say that he did get to this guy. And the only point I want to make here in verse 14, then we're going to go on, he began to be in want. Now he's noticing this wasn't such a good idea. It was fun while I had money. It was fun while I was buying everybody drinks. There's an indication here in verse 30, the older brother said he spent his money on harlots. It's great when all the pretty girls were around, but now that I'm out of money, they're not around anymore, and I'm alone. And I don't have a support group here because I left my support group, and I'm out with strangers, some of us have lived this way, haven't we? Don't raise your hand. We're on camera. <laughs> I'll say it. I've lived with, you know, as in a community where all we wanted was to have immediate gratification. And if the means to immediate gratification wasn't available, the community broke up. Because it was all about the next thing to be gratified with. And so he's, these things are starting to, to, to kind of disappear. And he's beginning to feel it. <clears throat> we have to feel the consequences of our sin. I'm, I'm gonna, I saw a bumper sticker years ago, and it's a, it's a little bit rude, a little bit crude, tiny bit, not terribly. And I've always wanted to say it in church, and I never have, but I'm going to today. So either next week the church will be twice as full or empty. One of the, but I saw, I saw a bumper sticker one time. It, it just said, screw guilt. I don't want to feel bad. Feeling bad feels bad. Nobody wants to feel bad. But guilt and shame and negative consequences, when they begin to sober us up, are very, very good things. And we shouldn't rescue people from those times. Sometimes we need to let them feel those things in love. And once again, we don't know if the father could have gotten to this guy, but Jesus could have inserted that if he wanted to. But the point was this guy needed to feel like, I've done the wrong thing. And, 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 and that feeling and that sense of failure is going to run its course with this guy. And we, we read the whole story. It's going to turn him back to dad. But this is just the beginning of verse 14. He began to be in want. Not enough to where he's turning around yet. It hasn't gotten bad enough yet at the end of verse 14. It's going to, but now just the process has begun. 
Verse 15. So now he's doing things that he never thought he would do to stay alive. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed the swine, and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. Now, Jews avoided Gentiles like the plague, and so whatever degree of at least traditional Judaism this guy had, it's everything against him. He's happy to party with Gentiles, but he doesn't want to have to be joined to one. He doesn't want to have to work for one. And pigs were out, totally off limit, a part of the, you know, excluded in the kosher diet of Judaism. And so now he's got himself in a situation where he's joined to a heathen dog, if you will, and he's having to feed the heathen dog's pigs, which were off limits for a Jew. He's doing things he never would have thought. Now, it's a real interesting word here. Look in verse, where is it? Verse 15, and he joined himself. If you have the notes, look there. He glued himself. <clears throat> the Gentile didn't have a help wanted sign. This, this young Jewish son, this rebellious son, wasn't looking at the want ads of the local newspaper, and there was a want ad for pig feeder. Eat as much as you want. <laughs> You know, uh, this is what we pay. You can eat with the pigs and you can sleep in the barn. This guy wasn't advertising for the job. This guy, the, the younger son, sought him out. In the Greek, that's the way the verb breaks down. Uh, verse uh, 15 again, he joined himself. My paraphrase, he forced his way into the job. He's desperate, guys, and we need to understand the desperation. He's desperate to stay alive now, and he's, and he's forcing himself to do things that, that normally would turn his emotional and cultural and social stomach. I don't want to have to do this thing. And so he inserted himself. It's like he saw this guy had pigs, and he said, can I come and work for you? And the guy says, no. And he came back the next day, and he came back the next day, and he came back the next day, and he kept coming, and he wore the guy down because he's desperate. And that's the intensity of the verb. It's in the imperative, present, continuous form. He was doing it, and he kept doing it, he kept doing it, he kept doing it, because I'm starving. You need to know that. This guy didn't just have pity on him. It's like, okay already, go feed my pigs. And so now he's living under the, the rule and the, and the authority of a guy that he wouldn't want to be near, and he's doing things he doesn't want to do, and he knows the guy reluctantly has him there anyway. Can you feel it? Tell me yes. yes. You, you have to feel it. When I'm joined to people, I want, I want to know, I want to have a sense that they like me. When I join myself to a community of people, I want to feel like they're glad that I'm there and would be sad if I was gone. This guy doesn't feel any of that. There's no community. There's no fellowship. There's no friendship. He has to force himself into somebody's life. He has to find a couch to sleep on. He has to find things to sell at the pawn shop to buy his next little bit of drugs. He has to keep lying because he's going to get caught in this crime. He has to try to make new friends. He has to sink down to the level of hanging out with people he never thought he'd hang out with because of the consequences of his sin. And that can happen under the bridge or that can happen on Wall Street with white collar people. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Any, any strata of society, that can happen. This guy doesn't want to change the books for, for the company, but he has to skim a little bit off the top, and now the janitor saw him, and now he's got to pay off this stupid janitor who doesn't have a college education, who he's always hated anyway, but now this guy has leverage on him, so now he's got to steal a little more to keep the janitor quiet or else he loses his job. It, it can happen on any strata. The thing, the thing about this is, is this. Life apart from the Father always seems better until it runs its course, and it's not better. And you become somebody that you didn't want to be. Verse 16, he's feeling it. And he would gladly have, he would have gladly eaten the pig chow. The Purina pig chow. He couldn't even have the pig chow. He, he was so low. He would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. And no one gave him anything which was good. Because he's... He's right, he's right on the cusp. He's, he's, right, he's right on the threshold of, of making the decision. And, and, and the Lord knows, doesn't he? And you can say amen after this if you want. The Lord knows sometimes how much it takes for us to finally make a decision, right? Amen. How low do we have to go? Surprisingly low sometimes. Verse 17. 
but he makes the decision. This is a, this is, this is a picture of repentance, by the way. This is a, this is a short little study on, on what repentance is, verse 17. When he came to himself, it's like he had been absent from himself. It's like his mind had checked out from, from sensible thinking, and now his sensible mind rejoined him. He came to himself. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? This was an honest self-examination. He doesn't blame shift. In the story, Jesus, Jesus presents him in such a way, he doesn't say, my stupid dad or my, my older brother, he's going to get the double portion. He always thinks he's so hot. He pushes me around. I mean, he doesn't, there's no blame shifting at all. Was life at home perfect? There's no family that's perfect. There's no, there's no home that's perfect. Right? But he doesn't blame shift. He said, I did this. He owns it. He realized how much he had forfeited. Life with father had seemed so restrictive. Now it's seen for the good that it was. Guys, notice, this has to happen. This has to happen when a person comes to the Lord or returns back to the Lord. This has to happen. Oh, my life as a Christian, I couldn't do this and I couldn't do that and it stunk and this and that and everything. I'm going to go out and do that and then you're out doing all that and you're kind of going, those people loved me and, you know, wow, I, you know, I guess it wasn't so bad after all. Verse 17, he came to himself. How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? He had an honest evaluation. And the things, guys, understand, understand this. The things that used to get under his skin, the things that used to bother him. I don't like that my dad says we have to have turkey on Thursdays, you know. And I don't like that I have to fold my napkin in my lap. And dad tries to make me act like a gentleman. And he's so oppressive. I just want my freedom. Fine, go eat pig slop if you can. Suddenly that stuff wasn't so bad anymore. And he's realizing I've forfeited so much. Verse 18. I will arise and go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. He recognizes that he needs to repent and he plans his steps of repentance. He doesn't ask to be reinstated into his sonship. He doesn't ask to be made... Okay, the sonship would have been the best thing, right? He doesn't ask to be made a family slave because though a slave was a slave and not a son, they were still considered part of the family. He was saying, take me as a, as a day laborer. You know the guys that, that stand out by Home Depot? The guys that stand out looking for... I mean, you, you might use those guys for a day or two or three and you might hire them or whatever, but you don't invite them over for Christmas dinner. They're not part of the family. Maybe if you have a full-time uh, house cleaner or a chef or like, yeah, we're a rich crowd. I'm sure we all do. <laughs> you invite them over because they're kind of like part of the family. But he doesn't even ask to be part of the family. He just says, take me on as a day, as a day laborer. I'm, I'm not, I don't deserve anything. I, I blew it with you, Dad. And notice that he also includes, guys, he's also understanding that he sinned against God. I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm not worthy to be called your son. That which was freely granted to me, I have forfeited. That which was given to me. He, did, he wasn't a son because he earned it. He was, he was a son because God allowed it. He was born into a family that, that had money. He was born into a family where there's a dad that loved him. By the way, there's a little saying that I've recently discovered the last year or so. Some people are born on, th born on third base, but they think they hit a triple. Get it? That's a good one, huh? Some people are born on third base, but they think they hit a triple. We stand on the shoulders of people. If you have a good family, if you have a good job, if you have a lot of blessings in your life, it's not saying that you didn't work hard to get them, but... but Often, and, and perhaps even very likely, somebody labored hard before you. If you're the first college grad, it's because somebody gave you a stable home, probably. Are there exceptions? Absolutely. If you have a Christian life, maybe it's because it's your parents were the first people in their family to turn the tide of unbelief, and maybe they're the first Christians, and they were the first ones to bring their kids to church, and now you grow up with a, with a pretty stable life, but you weren't born on third. I mean, you were born on third, excuse me. 
You were given an advantage. And this guy is realizing, I had a great advantage. And there's nothing wrong with having a great advantage. If God wants to give somebody a great advantage, fantastic. Be blessed. But just realize that it's been given to you. And he says, I don't even deserve to be your son. I, that was given to me. I didn't earn that. I'll, I'll, I'll just pay me minimum wage and let me show up and work. That's all that I'm asking. Guys, when people repent, they don't make conditions. They just repent. Does that mean nothing was wrong where they came out of? No, never. But it means they own what they own. And they don't, they don't make a deal. Verse 20, and he arose, and he came to his father. This is beautiful. This is the heart of God. When he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck, and he kissed him. And the son said to him, he starts rehearsing his speech, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And we're going to see here that the dad just interrupts him, and he can't even, the dad is so happy to see him, he doesn't even let him get out his speech. Now notice a couple of things here. In verse 17, 18, and 19, he's thinking about repenting. And then in verse 20, he, he repents. It's not enough to think about turning back to God. You have to actually, say it with me, turn back to God. And some people, I wonder if some people think, well, I'm thinking about turning back to God. I'm thinking about it, and I'm thinking about it, and I'm thinking about recommitting myself to my marriage and to my family and to, to my this or to my that. I'm thinking about it, and I know I probably should, and that, that's all really good. But guys, thinking about it isn't doing it. It says in verse 20, he arose, and he did it. And I just want to encourage you today, if any of you have been kind of hanging out with the bacon crowd. <laughs> That's a bad joke, huh? If you're in a place where you shouldn't be, and you're thinking, and it's kind of getting hard, good. It should get hard, because it'll change your mind. And, when, and as you're starting to come to yourself, and you're saying, you know, I really, you know, I should get back, fantastic. I've talked to some people in the last year that have been thinking about getting back to Jesus for about two years. I'm glad they're thinking about it, but at some point you got to do it. You just got to do it. You have to arise and you have to go to the Father. But he does. He follows through. And we see that he's not even able to finish his request. And the father is so glad to see him. So we've looked at the rebellion and the repentance of the younger son, according to your notes. We've only looked at the younger son so far. I've got to go faster if we're going to get out of here today, someday, sometime. So I've got, but the younger son, I mean, it's not just about him. This is also a parable about the father and about the older brother. We've looked at his rebellion, but we've looked at his repentance. And it's real repentance. Now we see the father's response to the younger son. Back in verse 12, the younger of them said to his father, give me my portion, so he divided it. This was a huge insult, but the father did not punish him at that time. He basically said, okay, son, if that's what you want, if I'm dead to you, I'm dead to you, take your stuff and go your way. And, and I believe the father has a broken heart over this. Verse 20, the father receives back the rebellious son, Look at verse 20. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. The father was looking for the son. <laughs> if somebody backstabs you, do you have a Hallmark card ready for when you see them next? I mean, I... That's, I, I say that because it's like, I can't say that I do. You know, I don't, I don't have Hallmark cards in my glove box in my car with all the different names on them <laughs> of people that seem like prodigals to me, you know. But the father's looking for the son. Guys, and this is a picture of God's love. This is a picture of God's love for people that do the worst of the worst against him and break his heart. They blame his church. They malign the name of Jesus. They mock him. People mock God today. Have you, have you noticed? People mock God. They mock Jesus. They mock Christianity. So there's some of what's called Christianity that, I, that I'm embarrassed of. 
But the true faith and the true Jesus and true God the Father and the true work of the Holy Spirit is mocked today by people that are called haters of the gospel and enemies of the gospel. And God loves them. And he's waiting for them to come to their senses to realize this isn't so fun being a mocker. This isn't so fun throwing rocks at at stained glass windows. I'm tired of this. And God is looking for people like that. He's ready to receive them. The father was looking, and, he, and, he, and when he saw his son, he comes and he runs to him. Culturally speaking, very undignified for an older man to run in that day. And they, you know, they wore the long flowing robes and all that, so you don't run. I've never had a long flowing robe, maybe only in the hospital. <laughs> and drafty in the back, you know. <laughs> But it's not something you run in. You know, you have to pull it up and you have to pull it up between your legs and tuck it into your belt. And I mean, and plus old men running is just not a pretty picture anyway, right? <laughs> I mean, right? He doesn't care. He's totally, I mean, he totally kind of just humiliates himself in front of everybody to run it. And he, and he f- falls on, this, on his son's neck and he starts to kiss him and the kid hasn't even bathed. He's got pig stink all over him still. And, and the community is just saying, I've seen adults do this with their children. I remember a number of years ago watching a father get down on his knees on a sidewalk pleading with his daughter to come home, and I'm just thinking, I'd slap her. (laughs) That's what I was thinking. But it wasn't my daughter. It was his daughter. And he humiliated himself in some ways because of love. I mean, what if people were looking out the window and say, what's what's Mr. So-and-so doing, that little bratty daughter? I, I watched that happen one time. The father didn't care because he's so full of compassion for his son. And he embraces him. And, 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 and the, the verb for kissing there means to, to kiss repeatedly and passionately. I mean, it wasn't just some little kind of little European thing kiss, right? It was like he was just kissing him all over, just all over his face and his neck and son, you're home. And he still smells and he's dirty and he's filthy. And he doesn't put him on probation, He doesn't say, you'll be my son after 30 days or 60 days if you don't mess up and crawl across broken glass. There's none of that. He just says, I receive you. You're sorry. We're done. It's okay. You apologize. It's all good. I love you. I never stopped loving you. Look what he says in verse 22. The father said to his servants, bring out the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf here kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and... For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he's found. And they began to make merry. This is beautiful. The father publicly restores the son. He says, I want you all to have my heart about this. He doesn't just say, I'm going to throw a a, a party for my son. If you want to come, you can. He's like kind of almost commanding people. You need to come and be with me because this is an amazing event. And he's publicly restoring dignity to this son that humiliated his dad, humiliated and broke the heart of the community, and humiliated himself and didn't care about his older brother. And dad is reinstating him and saying, and dad is the authority. So dad is saying, you know what? This is okay because I said it's okay. It's not only just okay, this is good because I said it's good. This is my son. He was dead and he's alive again. I want you to be happy with me. And Jesus is talking, remember who he's talking to? He's, he's talking to older brothers who were not happy that Jesus received sinners. We're going to get to the older brother in a second. Jesus is saying to the older brother, you don't have the heart of God. You call yourself men of God, but you don't have the heart of God because the Father is happy when people come back. Verse 40, 24, excuse me. My son was dead and he's alive. Notice, guys, he says, my son. This is my son. He was lost and is found. And the father's heart is glad. And he's inviting people to be glad with him. Verse 25. Now his older son was in the field and he came and drew near to the house and he heard music and dancing. Snapshot of the older brother. He's a faithful worker. He's out in the field again. He's probably always out in the field. He's, he's obedient. He plays by the rules. He's probably up before all the servants and he works longer than them and makes sure they do all their work and works a little extra overtime and pats himself on the back and and commends himself. I'm the older brother. This is all going to be mine someday and I'm going to show everybody what a hard worker I am and I don't think I'm reading into it because we're going to see that we're going to see his attitude with dad here in a minute. By the way, as the older brother, he would have had a double portion of the inheritance. 
Notice back in verse 12, the father divided it to them. The younger son asked for my one-third of the inheritance, but the older brother didn't say, what are you talking about? He's probably saying, I'm glad you asked. He, he wants his stuff too. He didn't say, no, father, that, that's an insult. I'm not, you know, he didn't do that. He said, oh, sure, I'll take my stuff. I wasn't going to ask for it, but since he asked, hey, why not, you know. In his own heart, guys, he's also saying, dad, this is just a working relationship. This isn't love. This isn't, this isn't, this isn't father, son. This is like, you're the owner, and I'm, I'm, the, I'm the heir apparent. And in his mind, it's not about relationship at all. It's just about stuff. But he looked good, didn't he? Right? The older brother looked good because he would never ask that. But I'm sure glad my punk brother did. So he's going to get his stuff too. The older son didn't object. The younger brother's departure affected negatively the potential future worth of the, of the estate because if he would have stayed and they would have all worked together, the estate might have grown and eventually the older brother would have had more. So he's not only mad at dad for letting the younger brother go because that minimizes the exponential growth of the estate, he's also mad at the younger brother because you took part of my potential earnings, my future earnings. You've hindered me. And so he's mad at dad. He's mad at his brother. Verse 28, he understands what's happened, but the older brother, but he was angry and would not go in. I'm not going to go in. I do not share the joy of my father. I'm not happy that my brother is home I'm angry with him, and I'm angry with my dad. The the older brother had no natural affection or love for his brother at all. And guys, this is this really this one got to me. He was angry and would not go in. He wouldn't even go in. He wouldn't even go into the party and and say, Dad, could I speak to you for a minute? I'm struggling with something. There's there's no absolutely no respect for dad at all. He makes dad come out to him. He makes dad leave the party for his dead little brother who came back to life. And he makes dad leave the party and go meet him in the field. Can you feel the disrespect? Yes or no? I I guess I just need to hear you guys talk talk to me. (laughs) Totally disrespects his dad. Totally. This is humiliating. But he doesn't care because he really doesn't love dad. He just wants stuff. And he's going to be obedient and look good until he gets his stuff. Verse 9, his father comes out to plead with him. He answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. You didn't even give me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. He revealed here, guys, and this is revealing the heart of the legalistic older brother. And this is very similar to what we would have studied in Galatians. Hey, Dad, you owe me. What do you mean I owe you? I brought you into this world. No, you owe me now. It's gone beyond father, son. You owe me. And so in essence, this man, if the the father is God, this man is making God his his, his debtor. You owe me. I've been good. I've obeyed. I've, I've played by the rules. I come to church all the time. We've stayed married. We would never touch alcohol. We never touch cigarettes. And we don't go to movies. And I write my check every week. And I make sure that we're, you know, all this stuff. And he's congratulating himself. And because he plays by the rules, he thinks that God owes him. The older brother thinks that the father owes him. These many years I've been serving you. And he says, you didn't even give me a young goat that I might have a party. And it's like, son, this isn't about a party. It's about a resurrection. (laughs) Can you see the difference? We couldn't have fun, daddy. Your brother was dead. And you're, you're, and you're mad because you couldn't even have fun with their fans. Are you kidding me? Can you, can you see the... He doesn't have the, the, the mind and the heart of the father at all. He's just mad because he couldn't have his party. Sorry, I, the voice helps. Don't you, think? I, I, you know, it's like, are you kidding me? You don't, you don't have a clue. You have no perspective. In your own way, older brother, young, older son, you're just as self-absorbed as he was. At this point in the story, who's closer to the father, the younger or the older brother? Who looks better on paper? Who do you think's feeling kind of hot under the robe right now? The Pharisees. They know they're the older brother. We look so good, but oh man, he's killing us here. And that's what Jesus meant to do. Because as the younger brother needed to feel it, so did the older brother. Because he was legalistic. 
And he didn't want to receive sinners. Verse 30, as soon as the son of yours. He doesn't say, he doesn't even say, as soon as my brother. <laughs> he doesn't even own him. As soon as the son of yours came. And he, he devoured your livelihood with harlots. So apparently that was part of it. You killed the fatted calf to him, for him. The older brother felt he deserved more. But he was a prodigal too. He was a prodigal in, in self-righteousness. He was a prodigal in congratulating himself that he's better than the younger brother. He, he's, he's just as far away as the younger brother was, even though he came to church and played by the rules because he didn't have a love for the father. Guys, the whole thing that was missing with both of these guys was a love for the father. At this point in the story, who loves the father now? The younger brother loves the father now. Dad, you're, you're way too good to me. I don't even deserve this. Older brother does not have the father's heart, doesn't love the father, doesn't care about the, the, re, the returning sinner. Look at verse 28. The father's response to the older brother. He was angry and would not go on. Therefore, the father came out and pleaded with him. He continually pleaded with his son. Guys, isn't it amazing that God would ever plead with us at all? Could, don't, don't you think as God, doesn't he have the right to just say, I give you 24 hours to repent. After that, I'm moving on. Of course he has that right. But he doesn't. He waits and he pleads and he sends... I remember the Christians that came after me. I mean, they were like hound dogs. I was like a coon up a tree. I didn't stand a chance. I mean, these people were coming after me. It's like, okay, I get it already, you know? Well, the Lord didn't owe, owe me to seek me out at all. I deserved his judgment. But he had mercy on me and sent people into my life to love me and care about me and, and send me postcards and, and, and witness to me and enroll in every class I had at Cal State Fullerton. Ugh, you know? Why are you following me, you know? And the father doesn't owe that to anybody, but he goes and pleads with the older brother. He pleads with sinners to come back to him. Verse 31. Look what he says. He says to the, younger, to the older brother, excuse me, son, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours. Isn't that enough? You have me. But it wasn't enough for the older brother because the older brother thinks that he deserves more than just the father. What, what a twisted view of religion. My father owes me. Verse 32. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. The, the older brother, guys, is self-righteous and he demands a reward. And because he's self-righteous, he blinds, he's blinded regarding reconciliation. He doesn't understand. He's not happy. He's not happy. Guys, what, what? I got to wrap this thing up. Man, oh man. Timothy Keller has a book. I think we have it in the bookstore. It's called The Prodigal God. And the word prodigal means excessive. And in his mind, God's love for sinful people is excessive. God just lavishly pours out his love on people. And so he calls him the prodigal God. But in, in the book, Timothy Keller makes a statement. He says, in some of our churches, why aren't, why aren't, why aren't sinners comfortable? Why, why, in your life, are sinners comfortable with you? If they're not, there might be different reasons. But could it be that you have a lot of older brother in you? Ooh! Right? Feel that one? Or do we have to line you up and shoot you one at a time? <laughs> right? When sinful people get around you, are they comfortable? Jesus, Jesus didn't... You know, he didn't, he didn't compromise with sin, but he welcomed them. But a lot of, a lot of churches, are, 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 is it be, are they empty because they're full of older brothers? And somebody comes in off the street and you're thinking, you can't sit there. That's my pew. I pay for it. Yeah or no? I mean, yeah? yeah. <laughs> Guys, may there be no elder brother in us at all. Because you, if you're a Christian, you were the younger brother. And you may, you may be here today and say, well, I, I didn't mess up as bad as you did, Pastor Bill. Well, good. God intercepted you. But given enough time, you probably would have in your own way. And it doesn't matter because you were a younger brother apart from God. And he came and he looked for you and, and he welcomed you when you said, you know what, I need you. May we never go from being 
repentant younger brothers and then suddenly get comfortable with ourselves to where we're like self-righteous older brothers. Because nobody wants to be around an older brother. This is called the parable, the parable of the prodigal son, but it's the parable of the prodigal sons. There's two of them. And Jesus doesn't finish the story because they're going to finish the story with how they decide to live. And you're going to finish the story by how you decide to live. If you have any older brother streaks in you, we will have exorcisms right after the service. <laughs> if we can't pray it out of you, we'll beat it out of you. We don't care. <laughs> there can't be any elder brother in us, guys. We need to be able to hear God say to us, I've always been with you. You're always with me. Isn't that enough? Is that enough? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah, we have the Lord. And all that he has is ours. He doesn't owe us anything. We owe him everything. And if we keep that mentality, we will stay soft-hearted and won't we'll become older brothers. And as Jesus is marching to the cross, this is what he wants to say to people. Don't be an older brother. And understand that God loves and receives repentant sinners. Even with pig stink on them. Any questions? I know we had one from last week. Praise report. A friend of ours in Southern California has been healed. She's a 35-year-old Christian mother of two little babies and wife. After a two-year-plus battle, she was healed with stage four colon cancer. Fantastic. Part of only 3% of people to survive it. Praise God for his healing power and mercy. It has brought the family closer to Christ and to each other. We give God glory for that. <laughs> Question from last week, but I'm a good person. Do I deserve hell? We, we, we talked about this uh, in the top 10 questions a few months ago. And because of the time, a brief answer. Good according to who? If, you're, if you compare yourself with other people, I can find, I can find bass players that make me sound really good. <laughs> but Victor Wooten won't be one of them. <laughs> if you don't know Victor Wooten, a couple of us do. <laughs> good according to who? The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We don't dare measure ourselves with ourselves. We have to, we have to receive God's evaluation of us that we all need Jesus. And if we will, like the younger brother, come to, come to ourself and just say, Lord, I've sinned against you. I've sinned against heaven. Receive me back. Then we're forgiven. And he's happy to do that. That's why Jesus came. Are there any other questions? Let's stand together. We're always here to pray with you guys after the service here. Dear Father, thank you for your great love. Thank you that you receive sinners, Lord. And Lord, I pray that, that you would find among us and make us some of the most gracious and holy and truthful people on the face of the planet, Lord. May your church in Napa be known for grace and truth neither one out of balance, but both in perfect harmony. And Lord, may, may you show us your fantastic, amazing love to receive sinful people to yourself, Lord. And would you please cultivate that in us, Lord. And thank you, Lord, that we have been younger brothers. We have been the prodigals, and you've called us to yourself. And we're thankful for that, Lord. Bless these dear people, Father, and help us to keep considering uh, Jesus as we approach this Easter. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. One quick announcement. By the way, we're, we are joining about five or six other churches for a Good Friday service at First Christian this year. So put it on your calendar. Uh, they've asked me to speak. I'm excited about that. And so uh, be praying for that and be praying for the event and join us. God bless you guys.